Well, I'm trying to think too, again, thinking of the cyclo- cyclical issue that mm-hmm. you asked, things going in cycles. Wasn't there a group also at one point, Mothers in Architecture, mm-hmm. here in Chicago? Ah. I seem to remember that, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, maybe yeah, not maybe. formally formed, but I heard about it. Then there was another group, maybe doesn't particularly address your question, but they're speaking about the economy being in cycles. Remember the exhibit A dot? Architects mm-hmm. doing other yep. things. Yep. <laughs> okay, A dot. And that was a group of people in architecture in Chicago area. I was one of the people mm-hmm. who had the work exhibited. There were many. Um, I think there were like 50 or 60. It was a big show. Yeah. Like that. It was a big exhibit. But it was <laughs> architects who had, or, or yeah. in my case, architectural educators, people who had done other things besides architectural work. So painting and sculpture. And it was really interesting. Mm-hmm. But it was a way to showcase their work during a time of recession and how they were making a living or how they were engaging in their creative talents during that time. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it was so again, sometimes exhibitions and events like this can also have an afterlife too that can be uh, a way of advocating for change. And just a quick plug, these sorts of exhibitions that you're mentioning, Catherine, and this goes out to all of you too. Whatever you don't see, you'll, you'll notice that there are a lot of gaps in this timeline. And that's sort of because we are we are of the understanding that there's a lot of these grassroots or localized events and exhibitions that might have impacted you guys directly in your development in the field that we might not have known about or might not be written down in a history book. So we invite you. There's actually on top of that pedestal some cards to write down some suggestions for things to add to this timeline. And we'll pick it up as it as it goes. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- I'm really curious about that. I'll talk about the sort of practice of the site of activism. But for two reasons, I think one is kind of like Paul Muir's question. I think when we start to think about ourselves as sort of workers, when we start to think about the structures of practice, it kind of puts us in league with other workers in interesting ways, right? Like family medical leave is not just an architect's act, but it, it, it sort of helps us expand the kind of political nature of what we do in, in a way that's direct with our lives. And, and that's really important because a lot of times architects usually think about our work as the kind of vehicle for making change mm-hmm. rather than you know our working condition and changing our working condition as a legitimate side of making change. Um, and you know, I think I think uh, when you start to think about work like that, it, it's it's a challenge because the ethical arguments really only they only get you so far, right? Because like systems of sexism and, and racism, classism. Etc. are just so structurally entrenched. So, you know, making change really means kind of like build, building power in, in workplaces. And so I'm kind of curious in, in your experience doing this work, uh, how you sort of been, been able to build that power, like how, what kind of alliances do you make, how do you navigate the like, office floor, right? So like build, build the kind of alliance you're going to make, like how you make yourself sort of like indispensable in the office, or you need rockets, like, like what is it? How do you how do you build that power? Great question. Somebody else. Go ahead. Go first again. <laughs> um, I uh, I'm not sure, but I guess I. So for me, I um, somewhere along the way, maybe I had another aha moment, or maybe it was just one of my personal goals or whatever. But I, I did want to. It was important to me to be an owner of a firm eventually. Um, I didn't want to be a sole practitioner um, because I'm more collaborative. Um, I didn't actually think I would have, I would end up in as large of a firm as I did. Uh, But that's like another, the firm grew here through a series of mergers. So um, the Chicago office is only, I think we're around 65 people now. And it's never actually been much bigger than that. Um, But I always, have a um, somehow I guess this is maybe one of my dad's lessons he taught me was always have a plan B and plan B for me was that um, if they fire me or if they're not promoting me I'm leaving and I'm taking clients with me <laughs> so and nobody tells you that so nobody, I don't know if anybody ever told you that but nobody told me that but that was the thing that always have a plan B and also, also um, keep your resume and your passport current so you know so that kind of at a certain point it, it's hard um i mean i think um 
there's so much to learn, you know, about being an architect too. And when you when you're a good architect, then it's hard to move from. Um, uh, you have to want to make that move uh, to move away because it is it's really great to work on projects and to design and all of that. And when you start to take on the other responsibility of bringing in work, you can't do that on every project. You know, it's you're only one person, so you have to sort of let go of some of that. Um, but uh, but that's kind of it. And I, I think also I um, matured away. So as I, I mentioned sustainability and as I kind of moved a little bit away from my work on uh, gender equity and really, really focused on sustainability, it might have been a, somewhat of a timing thing because I think I was, I was here in Chicago right at the right moment under Mayor Daley and with his, all of his green agendas. And I think that allowed me to make a niche in my firm that... Um, that you know put me, it, it put me in an expert position in a way. Mm -hmm. So I think that helped as well. Um, yeah. So I might jump in not add? just not as an activist myself necessarily, but having spoken with the Kerry activists, um, because I remember one of the things that came out of their uh, interviews, their oral histories, is that I mean they were all the at the lowest rung in their offices. They had nothing to lose, and that was very important in their decision to do something. Is that it couldn't get any worse for them at the bottom of their office. In fact, they formed alliances with all the other low-rung workers at big firms and were sort of building their projects and their exhibitions using the copier after hours, you know, kind of doing all this stuff, like kind of stealing the model shop um, as a way to sort of, you know, take advantage of the fact that they were marginal in their firms and use that as a site of organization. I don't know if that rings true for any of you. Yeah, but and I think maybe that you know if you if you have a plan B in a way you have nothing to lose, right? You <laughs> I know. That's true. That's so. very true. You also have to stop to think too about the the history of so many of these organizations and what's represented around the the, the gallery here, pre internet, right? Mm -hmm. So how easy it is now today with Facebook and all the social networking possibilities that we have. You know, you did Facebook advertising for this. Mm -hmm. we, look at the nice crowd we have tonight. Well, to get a group like this together, to have a similar event back before we had all these things, you know, you had to send out announcements through the mail, the old fashioned way. It was just harder to do things. So you also, it, it makes the accomplishments of decades past even more remarkable when you look at it from that point of view. Did we answer your question or did you want more commentary on it? I think another, because you were asking about how do you continue to activate or to mm, kind of support yourself and pull yourself through. Is that no, just how you build power in the workplace? Oh, build power. power. See, I think that one thing that's interesting is the idea of needing to see someone where you want to go in order to believe that you can get there. So, you know, we'll say um, young black kids think the only thing they can do is be basketball players and rappers because that's where you see famous black people. But I think that when you are already in the place of saying, like, you want to take some ownership for yourself and, like, build power for yourself, you should just look at what you want to do and not so much about, well, does that is that person like me? Can I be that person? Well, no, you should think of yourself as an individual who can kind of get to anywhere that you need to, which is kind of a remarkable headspace to put yourself in. But... You, I don't think they should necessarily need to see yourself in the people who currently hold the position where you want to go because that's how you see change. So I guess, like, for example, I'll, I'll often find myself in rooms with a lot of with people who are a lot older than me who do not look like me and are not the same gender as me. And I think that's a good thing because that's how you bring that diversity. And I, I think it's important that we continue to see ourselves in places where we might not otherwise. And I think challenging that mental space that maybe you get locked into is a way to get power for yourself. Which to me sounds like getting out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. That's okay. a short think, way to say it. I think it's important. <laughs> That's what I meant. It's important. I mean, maybe, maybe for everybody here on the panel, this is their comfort zone, but, mm -hmm. but, but for a lot of people, it wouldn't be. So mm -hmm. being able to be in a, in a space where you feel, okay, I'm pushing myself a little bit more than I would be otherwise, but, but it's important. I feel point. like, yeah. If, yeah. I, if I can add one more thing to that that you made me think of. Um, it's also making sure, um, like, so I guess then once you're at my level that uh, 
you're advocating in, for the promotions. Mm -hmm. You know, making sure that the promotions are diverse. And we didn't talk tonight. I thought maybe it would come up, but to me, like one of the biggest challenges right now is what they call unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and yeah, and so you have to remind yourself, like you're you're here. You know, I like that's part of my job. <laughs> another job like I needed another job what am I you know, cause sometimes I'm still you know I'm the only woman in the room I mean, you know so I'm right now hopefully this is going to change very soon but I'm the only woman principal in the Chicago office I mean there's five you know, there's six and, and I keep saying why you know where are my friends <laughs> I don't want I don't want to be only girl architect lonely anymore <laughs> so and there's lots of women in my office. I mean, it's, yeah. So I think wow. it's going to change really soon. And speaking of that, that famous ad was what, 1921? 1921. So yeah. we're getting near the 100th anniversary oh, of that. Oh, yeah, right? that so ad. There'll be a, <laughs> that's another excuse to find some other event to commemorate that. Yeah. Are we still lonely? Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> not lonely anymore. The 100th anniversary of the ad. <laughs> Um, so, okay, last question, and then I'll, then we'll all make the last call at the um, wonderful Co-Prosperity Bar, which is cheaper than any other bar in the neighborhood. Um, anyone else have a question for the panel? I don't. Do you guys? No. So the question was about: Is there anything being done now to balance the power between men and women, or balance the experience of men and women? Maybe, especially as it relates to maternity and paternity, parental. Yeah. Do you guys know of anything? Mm, well, again, no. I think most of the laws that have been written apply to men or women, right? Paternity. Right. I, yeah, I thought so, but, yeah, but parental right. leave. Right, but for some reason, oh. Or is paternity less? Like it's too well, parental leave could oh, apply parent. to the male or the female, the mother or the father. But 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 there are certain things, and and I guess we didn't even bring up this issue right now. I hate to bring up something brand new when we're ready to close, perhaps. <laughs> but just think about this. But there are, in some ways, women are different from men, right? And so mothers who are new mothers require nursing facilities, okay, to nurse a new a new baby. So. Uh, lactation spaces in the workplace, that's a huge issue for a lot of people. And that is one reason why a lot of women have a hard time going back to work, because, even though many of them do, but they're forced to, even though the laws may, may dictate otherwise, some of them are, are breastfeeding, uh, or pumping milk in a room closet, in a bathroom, in a leftover space, in their car. I mean, bad places. And the, uh, the built environment needs to accommodate new parents and new mothers, especially in that area. And, it's, and we're not doing enough that way. So I think that's also something that we need to think about. And I will point you towards the end of our timeline. So you see there are a number of new recent um, initiatives here. And in 2018, we have this uh, great new text that's all about that. It's a, by a new mother who is an architect named um, Amity Hurst. And she is uh, specifically taking on the issue of lactation rooms in architecture firms, but beyond. And I mean, it's funny, you know, when we're talking about the offices of architects who know all their clients' needs, sometimes um, have trouble reflecting on their own firm's needs. So, so maybe with that, let's thank our amazing panelists and thank you guys for coming out on this Friday night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.